um, Google Drive links in the notebook. Hmm. Is that uh, do you like that? You want you like that that way? Um, I think I give links to specific um, CSV, a specific CSV maybe. So I didn't think I was sharing anything particularly sensitive since it's just the iris data set. So yeah, I didn't really think through it. I know people can manipulate stuff once I've shared the link, <laughs> but I'm not sure I'm too worried about it. Okay. Just, so I've just put a link in there to this web page, if you can see that. Oh, all right. So I've made little sub web pages. It's all a GitHub web page. <coughs> so if people want to navigate <clears throat> via that link, and, I, and I've put an open in Colab link. <laughs> mm. Now this is a big test to see if it works. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, I saw that. I think I tried that actually. You do have to log in, I think, to get up to do it, but should oh. just work. Uh, and I've just demonstrated that it does work. So I'm going <laughs> to hand it over to Joe. Thank you for doing this, Joe. I'll send <coughs> it over to you now. All right. Uh, <clears throat> that's a lot, Ed. Uh, I will now share my screen. All right, hopefully somebody can see my screen. Um, so what we're talking about today is just what I've termed the basics of um, data wrangling, I call it, but it's really just creating data frames with pandas. And um, <clears throat> you will see from the title that Ed shared for the talk this week, it's about file manipulation in Python. And um, I think a data frame is a good place to start because most of us are coming from R where we're used to working with data frames. So I thought this would be a nice way to start the conversation. So file manipulation goes, you, you dive into a rabbit hole, dealing with images, dealing with XML, JSON files, different things that are relevant when you're doing data science in Python or pulling data from different sources. Uh, so this is just the beginning, I guess. So in the coming weeks, I guess we'll be selecting another different file type to work with and how to basically manipulate it just so that we can all just get confident in dealing with data in the Python environment. So <clears throat> this is a Colab notebook. I guess I shouldn't go into what a Colab notebook is and what it does because that's what we did last week. But essentially this is a markdown sort of document that I've produced and I can open it in Colab and um, you might as well open it locally in your Jupyter uh, notebooks environment in your local Python uh, Anaconda installation. So you might do that, uh, but I've chosen to stick with Colab because it's the easiest way to share um, these notebooks amongst collaborators. So what is Pandas? Um, so Pandas is a library for reading and manipulating data, mostly represented as data frames, which most of us will be familiar with from R, just the term data frame, which will be a collection of columns that you've made into a table, and um, that's your data frame. <clears throat> so Pandas is pretty much the same thing. And in Pandas, your data will exist as either a data frame or a series. So a data frame is a collection of columns making up a table. But when you have only one column, what you would call a vector in R, um, then you, in, in Pandas we call that a series. So you have two series together, you've made a data frame. So you can have as big as 
a data frame as, as you can. This is just an image illustrating that. Um, so <clears throat> the, panda, the, the pandas data frame is the ground actually from which most of the modeling that you do in Python is based upon. Itself, uh, if I'm correct, was built um, on top of NumPy, the NumPy library, but Pandas is a bit more relatable because NumPy you work with only arrays which are like matrices, but Pandas gives you an option to label each column of that matrix the way you want, like the way it's here, it's labeled apples, oranges, apples, oranges. And then you can begin to associate it with real variables that you've collected in the real world, i.e. the data that you collected in your field. Um, so in this session, we'll try to learn the basics of reading and manipulating uh, tabular data in Python using Pandas. And we we'll just try to see if we can, instead of just talking in the abstract, just try and import a CSV file of random data and do an ANOVA on it. So um, that's what we are trying to achieve today. Um, I hope that's okay with everyone. If there are questions, just stop me because I can't see. Um, so I'll go ahead. Uh, installing pandas. So like many Python libraries, installing pandas itself is as easy as running a pip install command, which is what to our users would think of as install.packages. So uh, for Google Colab, pandas comes pre-installed. So if I run pip install pandas, it's going to tell me that the requirement is already satisfied because we already have pandas um, in in Cola because it's so popular that um, they decided to let it come preloaded. But if you're if you're running Python on your local computer, maybe outside um, outside Cola, you would need to run this pip install pandas to have pandas in your um, library, and you need to get used to running pip install commands. Um, almost every single thing in Python that you do, you are going to have to install it. When you open up R, you already know you can do some stats. R will come with lots of stats in it. But Python, for you to do stats, you have to install a stats module in Python because Python is a general uh, programming language. It doesn't come with all of the of some of the things we're used to, we're accustomed to in R. So similarly, to make Python uh, be able to handle data in the form of data frames, that's why you need this package called pandas, because otherwise Python will not have it. So now that we've installed pandas, <clears throat> we have to import it to be able to use it. Um, the import statement uh, for Python is just import pandas. So think you you would think of this as running the library function in R where you've installed a package, now you want to use it. But in Python, you, you <coughs> call that importing. So if you run import pandas as PD, um, pandas becomes part of your environment. And normally you can import pandas as as anything you know, as anything you want, you can import pandas as mangoes. It's going to store pandas as mangoes in your workspace. So the reason why we are importing it as PD is because it's standard practice and pandas as a module comes with many what we call methods or function within it. So many of those might be similarly named to other functions from other packages you have imported. So let's say, for example, you wanted to run something called pandas.mean. Uh, uh, 
So you maybe there's a specific way in which mean is calculated in pandas, so you want to use that. But there's already a mean function within Python, uh, so the two can clash. And it also it also happens in in R. I think sometimes you have a, a newer package superseding an older package that you've imported. If some functions um, end up being in each other's space. Uh, so the way you avoid that in Python is when you're importing your packages, you when you want to call functions from them, for example, if you want to call a function from pandas, you have to specifically say pandas dot something. So you, you would say numpy dot something if you're calling a function from numpy. So to avoid typing pandas every time, that's why uh, you just import it as PD. PD is short for pandas. So that is standard practice. Uh, so almost it's everywhere you go online and you find pandas code, you see everyone is importing it as PD. It has almost become just the way to do it, but you can import it just like, just as I showed you, as mangoes, it will still import whatever works for you. Um, so, <clears throat> We all know a data frame is a table containing our data, so it contains an array of individual entries, each of which has a certain value, and each entry corresponds to a row or a record, and you have different columns for that specific row. Um, <clears throat> so for you to set up a data frame in pandas, um, this will be very similar to what you know in R. So this is the first instance where we are calling uh, a, a function from pandas. So we want to set up a data frame. In R, maybe you do data dot frame. So in pandas, how you're doing it is pd dot data frame, and in brackets is where now you you define your columns and your rows. So the way we define columns and rows in pandas is by use of a dictionary. So a dictionary, as we all know, a dictionary is a collection of words and their definitions. In the Python world, a dictionary will be a collection of keys and their um, specific values. So the keys are the column names and the values are just a list of <clears throat> what you want your data frame to contain, the, the, your list of rows. So for example here, I was trying to make a data frame of year and R users. So starting from 2018 to 2021, in 2018, this is just made up stuff. In 2018, there were 11 R users at Harper. In 2019, there were 23. In 2020, there were 45, and now there are 55. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the way you do that is by setting up a dictionary. So a dictionary in, in um, I think I have a code block below this. A dictionary in, um, in Python, you set it up using these curly brackets. So the curly brackets are what defines a dictionary. And within those curly brackets, you have uh, a string value, <coughs> which will hold your key, and then a list which will hold what that key defines. So for example, here I've set up the first key is year, and then I follow that up with a list of 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and the second key is our users, and I've set that uh, those values up in a list. And if I call that, that's why here I'm just calling now data. I just want it to display what data looks like, and this is what it looks like. So I have just formed a data frame of two columns. One is year, the second one is our users. And um, that's how you set up a data frame simply uh, in, in pandas. So like I said, what we have just done here is we have used a Python dictionary and a list. Uh, so as, as we try to get used to Python, let's keep track of, okay, this is how we do things in pandas, but we should also keep track of the simple concepts of Python that we're learning in the process. 
So the concept here is the concept of a dictionary, which is a collection of keys and their values, and a list, which is just a list of uh, uh, whatever you want. It can be a text, it can be numbers, it can be objects, it can be other lists. So basic programming um, language sort of concepts. Um, so here I was just trying to just illustrate what I've just illustrated. For example, I made a dictionary of three programming languages. So the keys are R, MATLAB, and Python. These are these would be my columns if I wanted to set them up in a data frame. And what value what values do I want to attach to them? Then I've attached a value here, but you see it's not a list that I've put. I've just put a string as as the value for that dictionary, and I end up with it with this dictionary. So dictionaries are very, are very, very popular in Python. There are ways to pass things, things that relate to each other. For example, if you are setting up a database of um, students versus their majors in a university, you can set that up in a dictionary. Student A, major history, student B, major math, things like that. These are very popular concepts that you should try to pick up on. But here we're just trying to set up a Pandas data frame. So that's the basic way in which we uh, set it up. Um, a series, uh, on the other hand, is just a, uh, a list. So if you have a list um, and you want to turn it into a series, into one column in Pandas, you just do pd dot series and that would turn that list into a series so here for example i decided to form a second uh, a third column in my in my data frame but i wasn't sure uh, whether i have the right figures so i wanted to set it up as a series first set up an independent column and if i like it i'll insert it in my previous data frame with our users so I just set up uh, a series of the known values of Python users. So in 2020, in 2018, I say there were zero Python users. In 2019, there were 10. In 2020, there were 18. In 2021, there are 34. It's just a vector. Um, I use pandas to convert this list into a series. And this is the output that I get just this list so i'm running this top line here only where i say python users and the output that i get is 0 10 18 34 i've formed a, a list uh, i can also turn that list to have um, row names the way you have row names in python in, in r for example so that i can say the row names of that list are 2018 2019 2020 2021 so all I need to do is to, to the PD dot series is just to add a second argument which says index. So instead of having these indices of 0, 1, 2, 3, I want to get rid of them and they should represent those years where this data comes from. So I just say the index for this list is 2018, 19, 20, and 21. And what I've formed is, um, is, a, is a series. And once I have that series, I can easily add it to my data data frame that we formed before. So adding it uh, is as simple as having some square brackets and adding a new column name in it and then making it equal to the, the series that I formed before. So this is very similar, for example, to what you do in R. Perhaps in R, you'd go something like data, maybe all rows, and maybe just even data, uh, dollar sign, pi users, equal to whatever the hell uh, your list is. And in, in, in Python, it's just pretty much the same. You just have this square bracket and put the name of your column and then make it equal to the series that you formed before. Uh, so you will notice that 
uh, the series that I put in there is Python users. But let me try to put, if you remember, I made another series where I added the index to it uh, to, to label these as 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. So what I've just inserted is this, but if I try to insert this, it should, it should hopefully not work. If I do that, it's going to tell me, or oh, perhaps I didn't run this. And now I've run that. It's going to insert the the list, but with nuns. This is a problem because I defined an index here, but my original data frame did not have indices. It still has that 0, 1, 2, 3. So you have to keep that in mind. You have to insert um, a series that has the same indices as the data frame where you're inserting it uh, into. So if I go back to the one without indices, you see now the data has been in, uh, uh, inserted correctly. So that's just how you basically manipulate a data set um, in Python. Maybe are there any questions so far? So far, so good, Joe. It's, it's good. All right. Okay. Um, it's, striking, uh, some, it's striking in Python to me um, with some of these data types in in pandas that um, some things are exactly analogous to R, and uh, some things like the uh, the dictionaries um, they have more abstract uses. That, that there are ways to do similar things in R, but in day to day use, not so much. Yeah, and I think that's one of the uh, things that you have, one has to contend with when they're trying to migrate. You get introduced to new concepts that are similar to something else you do in another language that you don't really see why there are so many different ways of doing the same thing. But uh, I guess it depends on the developers of these languages and um, how they see the object-oriented world. That's why we end up with all these different ways of doing different things to achieve the same end result. And like you said, most of pandas really looks like R. And uh, some of it really looks like a complication of simple concepts, but all in all, it's, it's a data frame is a data frame, and once you get used to how they're formed in pandas, uh, it becomes intuitive, um, I hope. I'm not an expert in pandas myself, but just reading it becomes easy because I can relate it to R. If I was starting from a completely different base, I would struggle with even just contemplating the concept of a series and data frame, but it makes it easier because I'm relating it to R and they're so similar. Um, so ways to pull up elements, uh, rows and columns from a data frame. Uh, so the way you do that, there's so many different ways of uh, say, pulling up values from uh, from from a data frame, you know, just the normal index thing. Let's say you want to pull up uh, the value, the specific value in cell number five on column number, I don't know, seven, row number five, column seven. Uh, just those little things you will definitely need to do with your data. Maybe you want to just find uh, the mean of one column versus another, things just like those. And there are specific ways in which you do them um, in, in pandas. So there is a native way, a native Pythonic way, if I may call it, which is just by adding a dot and the column number that you want. Uh, this is what I've called um, native Python. Uh, which is option number one. So whatever column that you want to, uh, to, to, to get out, to extract, you just add the name of your data frame and a dot, 
and then you say um, the column name that you want, and then you put a, some square brackets, and then you put the number, the row number that you want. So for example here, if I wanted in my data, R user number one, so I'll just say from my data, dot R user column, fetch me row number one. From my data, dot Python users column, fetch me row number one. So something like that, it's, it becomes intuitive. I don't know, I have inv invaders in here. Uh, it becomes intuitive uh, once you get used to, to Pandas, but this is a native sort of Python sort of way of uh, uh, what we call accessing namespaces within your objects. So you can move between namespaces. Uh, this is a Pythonic way. Uh, Pandas tried to make it easier for you uh, to just refer to your column names directly. So they added, um, I don't know whether to call this a method, but they added a dot lock oper oper operation. So you can say data dot lock for location. And then you say, now when you're, you, when you're doing it in Pandas, you access the um, rows first and then the columns. So you will see a key difference here is I say data dot R users. So I'm accessing the column first and then I'm asking it which row to give me. Uh, so that's the native Pythonic way, but um, in Pandas, when you use the dot lock method, you have to access the rows first. So here I'm going to say, in my data, can you fetch me location number one of the columns R users and Python users? So that's just a way to access data in Pandas. And there's another way, if you don't know these the names of these columns, uh, or you really don't want to use column names, maybe you don't want to type um, the column names or they are long, then there is another method called iLock. So you can say, in my data, can you fetch me the location of, the, the first location, um, the first row, but fetch me the first and the second columns. So it's going to access the, the row first and then look for column number one or two. So just ways of indexing data and uh, extracting the specific uh, columns and rows that you want uh, in Pandas. So I've just run all three, all three methods and I hope they will all give me the same answer, which they do. So the native method um, has extracted 23 and 10. Um, the the iLock method has extracted 23 and 10. There's a difference in how they are presented, but it's essentially the same. R uses 23, Python uses 10. And the third method has also extracted the same 23 and 10. So this was just to il illustrate that there are different ways of um, accessing different rows and columns within the pandas um, data frame. Uh, I'll just mention here that most people when you move over into this environment of using um, high Python notebooks or collab, you get daunted by the fact that you don't see your environment. So uh, as you know in R you would have basically a window where you have your console, a window where you have your R script that you're writing, and a window that shows you your environment, and a window that shows you your plots. You don't really have that in an IPython notebook. It's meant to make it a notebook, literally, so that you can type notes and share with your friends. Uh, I got a question from someone, I think last week, that uh, this was a bit confusing because it just looks like a web page. But what I want to make it clear for others is uh, it is a web page because I'm running it off Google server. They've made this collab a piece of um, uh, this this collab tool for us to be able to run IPython notebooks. But it's a notebook just like our Markdown is a notebook. So all this text that I've put in here, it's me that 
has put them in so I can edit it if I want. So uh, it's just you just put code within you just put text within your code to assist you to, to guide you in um, laying out the information to others who are not who were not involved as you were creating the code. So I just wanted to um, reiterate that. So we were here. But if you do want to check, for example, what is in my environment, it makes it good. For example, for memory management, if you want to know what's, what are the names of my data frames. For example, if you had multiple data frames, there are ways to do it, to just have collab list for you, what's in your environment. So I think there's a there's this little handy tool called Who's. If you run that, if you run Who's, it just gives you everything that's in your environment the way you would have it uh, in other programming environments. So right now it's telling me I made data, I made mangoes. You remember I was trying to import pandas as mangoes instead of pandas as PD. And I imported pandas as PD, I made Python users, I made with years. So there's that way of just letting you know what is in your um, environment. Just a tip for anybody who finds this a little bit confusing that you don't see what's in your environment. So uh, I mentioned iLock and lock. iLock is conceptually simpler than lock because it ignores the, the, the indices that you've set. Um, we we treat the data set as a big matrix and we're extracting by index position. But obviously lock, um, which makes use of your specific um, variable names, is a bit more intuitive to most of us because we actually relate our columns to something we collected in the field. So maybe it's much easier to remember to use lock and most people will use lock because yeah, they 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 know their data, but if you don't know the data, maybe you're just a data scientist doing feature engineering, you don't know what's relevant and what's not, then you might use iLock, but lock will be used over and over again by most of us. Um, we can filter subsets of our data using some logic. So, for example, within the lock, we can say, give me the lock of uh, all the data where our users is greater than 25. These are just logical operations. And then give me only the year, then it will give you 2020 and 2021. So they are, uh, you can build logic into your lock um, to extract specific things based on specific rules that you've set, begin to make subsets of your data for sub analysis, things such as those. So these are just things that, um, you can get used to if you practice more, you wouldn't be required to remember this, but it's simple logic. You can set rules and pick up things that you want. For example, here I set up multiple rules. I said, can you give me where our users are greater than 25 and Python users are greater than or equal to 30 and just give me the year. And if I do that, it gave me this year 2021. And I've just printed all the data again, if you see here, just to check that that is true. So it's telling me 2021 is the only time when you have more than 25 hour users and more than 30 Python users. And that's right. So I was just illustrating that you can build lots of logic around um, pandas. Um, equally, you can delete, uh, deleting from the data frame is just dropping. That's what it's called. So you can drop, for example, a, an entire column. Uh, you can drop a row. So here I'm just illustrating. Uh, you can use data dot drop and then put in your column that you want. So it drops by axis. So the zero, the zero axis is rows. If you don't specify an axis, it will drop the rows before it drops any column. So for example, if I had a row named pi users as an index, it would delete that. But if I wanted to drop a column, I would need to say don't drop the zero axis, drop the first axis. 
this is something else that you have to remember in Python. Usually in R, if you want to access the first element, uh, the first row, first column of a data frame, you say data square brackets one comma one. Uh, in Python, it starts at zero. It doesn't start at one. So that's why here when I wanted to say I'm dropping axis, I want to drop a column, I'll say axis one. If I wanted to drop a row, I'd say axis zero. So that's just one thing you have to also keep in mind of as you uh, as you learn Python. <clears throat> so those minor, minor differences. Um, I'll speed it up a little bit since we're running out of time. Um, you can do row wise operations. For example, calculate the mean of every row. You can calculate the um, a log transform your data, for example, if you want to do a log transformation. So you can do such um, operations as well. There will be functions <coughs> and detailed instructions of how to do this in Pandas. So for example, here in this particular cell, I just try to log transform the, uh, the R users uh, column. And I also tried to just add a text column and um, I also tried to dif to divide um, R users divided by Pi users. So you can do that. Uh, there are pretty simple rules to, for doing that. And uh, the functions are there in uh, Pandas that you will be able to do that with relatively uh, very little struggle. So that's what I can say about basic things that you can do in Pandas itself. Pandas is huge. It has so many functions, so many methods. Um, the documentation is there and get daunting, but the basic things that you're going to do are just what I've talked about because the rest will be driven by your objectives. So if you want to n normalize your data or transform it in a certain way or all the feature engineering we do with our data, you can do it by just following the same sort of basic logical rules that you follow when you're programming in R. Uh, so reading a data, um, a data set from, um, from your environment in Colab, I don't know if I should go through this, but Colab will be set up by Google and they will give you, once you start running your notebook here, that you have a specific environment where you're working in, but maybe you have uh, stored your data in your Google Drive and you want to import that data into this environment and basically set it up. So you have to connect your Google Drive to Colab. You have to mount, it's what they call mounting, mount your Google Drive to Colab so that Colab can access all your folders in your drive and access the data you want. And that's what I've just done. There's this piece of code for mounting it. I, uh, I will actually acknowledge Joe Roberts. I've, I've kept this piece of code for a year and a half now from when we were doing um, our wit detection challenge. I go back to that notebook where you showed us this piece of code. If Joe is here up to now, this is how I mount my Google Drive into Colab. Uh, I don't know if there are other ways, but this is the practical way, way that I see. So I have a data set in my Google Drive. It's the Iris data set, which most of us will be aware of. And I, it's in my Google Drive. It's in this specific folder in my drive. Uh, it's called iris.csv and I want to read it, but now I've now connected my Google Colab to my um, to my drive. So in Pandas, I can simply do a pd read underscore csv. Sounds very similar to what you see in R, and it's it pretty much does the same thing. It reads a CSV. So instead of read dot csv, they just said read underscore csv. It's that uh, easy to remember. And if you do that, you are going to read this data set and store it uh, in a data frame called Iris. And you can call 
iris.head to just read me the very first, the five first rows in that data set. And if I do that, it reads my data and lo and behold, here are the first five rows. I want you to just confirm that, as you can see, we have five data points, but we are going from zero to four. This is just to remind you that Python starts counting at zero. So in R, this would have been row number one, but in Python, this is row number zero. So that's uh, just a small bit of um, tip you have to remember. It's pretty much the same. And from there, I can plot, for example, the histogram of the data. So Pandas has a method for that. So here, what I've said is um, from, from the data set iris, dot the column sep width dot can you please plot a histogram so it would have been plot dot bar plot dot scatter plot dot other things but i've specifically called plot dot histogram and it um it plots a histogram like this for those of you who have touched a little bit of matlab you will think, oh my goodness, this is a MATLAB plot. That's because Pandas is accessing Matplot library, and Matplot library pretty much takes the way MATLAB makes plots and puts it in Python. It's a, it's a plotting um, library that they've built in Python that is that heavily borrows from MATLAB's um, feel. So might as well plot a line. The the um, the procedure is pretty much the same from my data dot plot please plot me a line and i then pass into the line because the line has to have an x and a y i say x please take year y please take r users and make the line dark blue and it plots that line for me so you can do that basic plotting functionality obviously what i'm doing here is really very basic there's nothing to glean here but if it was your data maybe you wanted to find out if if you have right skewed data left skewed data this is how you'd go about making those initial explorations and uh, if you store for example residuals from a regression model you store them as a series and you want to see are these residuals normally distributed you would plot that series and see what you get. So uh, here I'm just showing you the basics, but obviously what you can do with this sort of functionality depends on your data. So this, this can get really powerful depending on your data. Similarly, you can plot box plots. Um, uh, so this is just the command for plotting box plot. Um, it's pretty much the same. Uh, you can do other things as well, like grouping data. So this is where um, you start seeing the sort of words that you would see in dplyr, for example, in, in, in R. Uh, so functions like group by will be inbuilt within pandas. So you can do something like iris. This my data set iris. Can you please group it by class and give me the mean of each class? Or you can say, group it by class but give me the standard deviation of each class and you've essentially but with those two commands made up a small table of summary statistics it brings you iris status as the mean is five for step length and so on and so forth a table of standard deviations and these are the standard deviations so you can start building those familiar summary statistics you want of course pandas itself can allow you to avoid this is essentially one two three four five lines of code to derive only the mean and standard deviation but uh, you might as well just run iris.describe and it's going to describe the data set for you so it's going to give you means and widths and lengths and all that so it's going to give you a count standard deviation minimum the the percentiles, the maximum, so the routine summary statistics that we expect, uh, for example, in R. So there are those um, functions. Um, so how do you use the data frame then? Because all this is fancy manipulation of the data. Yeah, we have a data frame, then what? 
uh, you can run your regression models on it. You can run your ANOVAs on it. You can use the data frame as an input to a uh, random forest or some artificial neural network, all those things. That's why at the beginning I said that Pandas is the ground from which you do many other things. So once you have your data frame, you're happy with it. Most of all the, mo all the modeling uh, libraries that we that we know of will simply ask you to give them a pandas data frame and the columns that you want to model so basically like r if you have your data frame in good shape or your tibo in good shape you can run all sorts of things from all different all different kinds of functions uh, using it so here just to illustrate that i imported stats models which is a library for doing statistics in python um, and when I imported it, um, from it, I've also made sure that I've imported OLS, which is ordinary list squares regression sort of modeling. So I've imported this specific uh, module. So it would be, for example, what in R you would say, calling the LM function, making sure you have that LM. LM maybe will come with, with base R, but like I said, Python is a basic programming environment, general purpose programming environment. You have to specifically import these things. So I've imported that, and then I've built an ANOVA basically of Peter length in the Iris data set as a function of class. Uh, so I want to find if there's uh, significant differences between classes on uh, the Peter length. So I built that model using OLS and uh, and then I request I want an ANOVA table from this model that I've specified. Uh, as you can see data equals iris. I'm, I'm building all this from the data set that I imported and if I do that it gives me a basic ANOVA table uh, a residual sum of squares, class sum of squares, degrees of freedom, all the sort of things that we're used to as agricultural scientists and the p-value here, then we can make decisions based off of that. So this is just an illustration of some of the things you can do with it. Or you can build um, just a regression model from it um, and run uh, stats models itself has a function called summary which is similar to the summary that you do when you run a model in R. So you can run mod.summary and get all the information that you want, some of it that I've never even heard of, Jack Ibera, so the strange things that I've never heard of, but basically you get your regression table here and uh, you can make decisions based off that and uh, the rest of the things you need R squared, adjusted R squared, uh, log likelihood, AIC, BIC, all those things that we're accustomed to, we get it, but I'm feeding in the same iris data set to the stats models um, library. So plotting residuals, you can also do that. I've just put a link here on some instructions on plotting residuals because I ran out of time and I thought this would have probably taken the entire hour that we have for this meeting. So I didn't have time to go into that detail. So uh, this is what I got. Um, questions and feedback. Thank you. That's great, That's great Joe. Joe. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think, um, I wonder if people, uh, could you indicate in the chat whether you uh, attempted to follow along in collab with that, like a why or a no if you were just uh, watching. A few people following along. I didn't notice you had the iris data set in there. I think one of the important things I would say um, for people is um, that trick of linking up the 
the uh, Google Drive. I also remembered it from when Joe Roberts brought fire to the um, cavemen back last year when we were doing it and had that little piece of code. I also saved it from that. Yeah, yeah. That was really helpful. It did actually, at some point, um, add a click button. And uh, if you'll show your uh, collab, Joe. Yep. There's that little folder on the left hand margin at the bottom of your screen. Uh, well, it's sort of in the towards the top. Yeah, that little folder. And it'll it allows you the folder on the top of that pane that's got the Google Drive symbol. <laughs> Just uh. keep going up to the right. That's your drive because now you've mounted your drive. But uh, if you go straight up on that with your cursor at the top of that little um, pane, there's the the dark folder that's got the Google Drive image on it. Keep going up. Keep going up. There you go. That one allows you to mount Google Drive and it inserts that little ah. bit of code down there. It's, oh. <laughs> it's ah. something I noticed. <laughs> that's oh, quite that's nice. That's handy. Yeah, I never noticed that. It, oh. it also allows you with those other things there to uh, to refresh and to upload stuff. Hmm. OK. Well, that's that's good. Oh, it's that simple. I, would, uh, I don't need to remember this. Oh, J Joe's code has just become obsolete in a second. <laughs> 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 All right. Yeah, so I think that's what I got. Um, that's great, Joe. Um, can we look forward to next week? Uh, now, now George Wager is on the um, is on the roster. I, I'm aware that George is uh, is probably uh, bruising her fingertips. Um, she says that she has a mic and she's going to come on and sing us a song here in just a moment. I'm just joking. She doesn't have a mic. I see that. Um, is it convenient for you to run one of these next week, George, or is it too? Is the timing bad because uh, you are writing up your MSc thesis? I'm just aware of that. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Very quickly. <clears throat> Joe Roberts. I thought I was. Um running one next week or have we got some wires crossed um i may have uh, done that but i thought i put you on the ro roster for week after next so the week after next i'm not available because i'm on annual leave which is why i thought it was the week no, is next week okay i didn't i didn't know that you're going on vacation george would you be willing to switch with um with joe yes Okay, yeah. perfect. That solves all problems. Thanks, George. Thanks, Ed. Do you know, um, do you have an idea what you want to do? Is there any prep for us for next week, Joe? No prep. Uh, I'll share a file uh, next week, early next week, but the plan will be to uh, build upon uh, Joe's very excellent introduction to pandas and maybe look at um, basic data visualization. Yeah, that sounds perfect. If you... Uh, there's no need to share it ahead of time, but if you do have it ahead of time, I'll I'll upload it with a collab link to the web page to make yeah. it as easy as possible for everyone. Yeah, and no, I'll share it ahead of time so people can take a look. Cool. All right, guys. Um, awesome. Thanks so much, Joe. That was cool. Thanks, everyone. My pleasure. Any final comments? Uh, we I have. Think I would want to encourage also uh, other people maybe to follow up, like Joe said on the pandas, follow up, pick a concept. Like my myself, I'm not an expert in pandas. I've learned a lot just by preparing this. So it would really serve most people here right if uh, after next week and after the next one, George does, somebody else comes and does a very simple topic should be collaborative. I think we will all learn faster as well that way. Spectacular. Thank you. And I'll see everyone later. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Joe. Bye.